We're very, very grateful that DNA evidence led us to Katie's killer, but we, we truly believe that taking DNA upon felony arrest will not only solve crimes, but prevent crimes and save lives. And that's why it's so important to us, because we know, for example, we know of a girl in Nevada, her name's Brianna Dennison. Had arrestee DNA been used in Nevada, she would still be alive, because the man that murdered her was arrested for a felony and then committed two rapes where there was DNA evidence. They would have had him identified and stopped him before he could kill Brianna Dennison in Nevada. And I've become very good friends with Brianna's mother, Bridget, and she's now fighting hard in Nevada for an arrestee DNA law there, which will be called Brianna's law there. So it, it saves lives, and that's what's important to us. Not only does it solve crimes, and that's very, very important, but it prevents crimes, it prevents rapes, it prevents murders. What kind of input are you getting from um, the folks around the legislature uh, here today and the Roundhouse on this new proposal? We're getting mixed reactions. There are people that are very, very much for it. There are people who, I believe, have misperceptions. And I think once those misperceptions are cleared up, they're going to be for it. I've had people say they're against it because if someone would, were to be wrongfully arrested, they, they fear that they wouldn't be able to get the DNA out of the database. And you absolutely can get it out of the database completely, fully, and very quickly. And I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, I've gotten to know the scientists that created the system very well. I've followed requests for an expungement to make sure that it's done completely and done well. So I know that it, it can get out of the system and it's done very easily. So that's one of the misperceptions that I think we need to overcome. Anything else that you're thinking about at the start of the session here today? Well, another thing I want people to understand is that DNA as it exists in the database, is no more of an invasion of privacy than fingerprints. Actually, it's less of an invasion of privacy. That's because there's only 13 locations on the DNA strand out of over 3 billion that go into that database. And they were specifically chosen by genetic scientists because there's no genetic information on those 13 locations. And it's also what's in the database has no names, no social security numbers, no identifying information. It exists in a computer and only surfaces if there's a match to crime scene DNA. After that match happens, it's retested to make sure there's not a mistake. Then and only then do they match that DNA profile to a name. And then and only then it can be given only to law enforcement that's investigating that specific crime as an investigative lead. Fingerprints, on the other hand, become part of your permanent arrest record. DNA does not. It's very, very protected. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. And um, good work on your, or, you know, I know you've been working hard on it. We've been working for five years, and but we believe in it. We've seen results. We've seen what it can do. We've seen the cases that, that, that it can solve. And another thing that's very important, DNA exonerates the innocent. And when there's DNA in a database and there's crime scene evidence and it's cross-referenced and a person who might be a person of interest doesn't match, they're automatically exonerated up front. You know, we've had so many people that have gone to jail wrongfully convicted because of false eyewitness testimony, because of bias, because of all kinds of reasons that have finally been exonerated because of DNA. Let's use DNA at the front end. Let's use it at the beginning of the process so those people never go through that system and are never wrongfully convicted in the first place.